How'd you guys sleep last night? Good. Tonight you're gonna have a good night's sleep. Well, driving up here is always um, just kind of reflecting on the last couple of years coming up. And what a blessing. What an encouragement to see what God is doing through the men over at Calvary Chapel of Downey. And if you're from another church, praise the Lord. You know, praise the Lord that he's drawing others as well. But if you would turn this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, and the passage I've been given is out of chapter 16, verse 8, but I um, just want to give a little background as well. I don't want to just kind of toss you into the book there. It's a wonderful book, the Gospel of John. But let me pray. Father, I do thank you, Lord. You are so good to us. You are so faithful. You are omniscient, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. You are omnipresent. You are here with us right now. Hallelujah, just as we were just singing right now. Praise be your name, Lord, because you so love the world that you sacrificed your only son, your only begotten son, just as, as we heard through Pastor Jason's message, in whom you are well pleased. And so, Father, through that, we want to please you. We want to love you. And as we are up here on the mountain, Lord, we've received through your Holy Spirit, your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We received the things that you want us to hear. As your word teaches, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so, Father, may these things resonate. I pray for the, for the message that Pastor Phil gave last night. May that resonate in our hearts here, Lord, out of 1 John. And what Jake shared, Lord, concerning the helper, I, I do pray that that would be something that we would find application to apply to our walk with you. And then with Pastor Jason, just the baptism, or the baptizo, Lord, that we would stop and realize and remember that we need to be fully immersed in you. And so, Father, may your Holy Spirit allow us right now to receive continually, to add to what you want to add and, and remove anything from this message right now that you want to remove. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so, here in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, the background to this, I could go back a few chapters, and if I go back a few chapters, I can go back to chapter 13, where Jesus is in the upper room. He had just declared that his hour had come. All through, through chapter 1, all the way through chapter 12, his hour had not come yet. In fact, he would say to his mom back in chapter 2, you know, what does this wedding that ran out of wine have to do with me? My hour's not yet. And he would continually bring that about to those that would hit him up for a miracle or a favor. And so chapter 13 would draw the line. It, it would draw a line in the sand for his disciples who had been following him and as he was ministering, as he was making the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, he was bringing the dead back to life. But most importantly, he was forgiving sins, just like he's forgiven my sins. Wow, what a miracle. He's forgiven your sins, I pray. And here in chapter 13, he, he said, my hour has come up there with his disciples. After he has eaten with them the Last Supper, he broke bread, you know, communion. He washed their feet. He, he, he shared with them that, you know, this new command that his disciples would love one another. By this, the world would know that we are his disciples. Wow, what a powerful thing for him to say to them. And then in chapter 14, concerning his going away, concerning his going away to his disciples, his disciples who had grown so close to him, this bond that had formed. You guys have bonds here. You guys have best friends in the ministry, perhaps, or throughout the church, a brother in the Lord who you can bond with. And if they or a family member, an important influential family member was to tell you, hey, I'm going to go away, but where I'm going to go, you can't go. You can't go either. 
right? You, you can kind of picture in your mind a, a little boy with his daddy telling him, you know, I'm going to go somewhere really fun, but you can't go. Wow. And, you know, he said that to his disciples in chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled, for I'm going to go away and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where I'm going, you cannot go, but I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And, and just know that I'm going to come back for you, though. So let not your hearts be troubled. See, he would prepare them. He didn't just up and leave in the dark. He was very upfront. He, he was very straight with them. He was very transparent with them in chapter 14. And he communicated that to them concerning these things that were on his heart. And also in John 14, chapter 16, he introduced the helper that was going to come, the Holy Spirit. That's kind of the theme of this weekend. I love that. Man, when I was given this passage, I was like, wow. And I looked at the other passages, I said, Lord, you're doing something. You've always done something. You're going to continue, but your Holy Spirit, the helper, the paracletus. He said in John 14, 16, he's going to abide with you forever. Forever is a long time, right? When we witness to somebody, we say, you know, this life is very temporary. We live in these bodies that are made of dust. Psalm 103 says that he knows our frame, he remembers we're dust. And one day we're going to go back into the ground. But our spirit, our soul, as we witness to somebody the gospel, and I hope we, we find time to do that because we, we have opportunities. This, this spirit, this soul it is going to go on forever. One of two places. And so when he said that the helper in John 14, 16 would be with us, he's going to be with us forever. You're never going to be without him. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of the living God in whom the Holy Spirit dwells? He dwells inside of you, and he directs you. He's the still, small voice that speaks to you. That's what our study is about today. But as we kind of reflect on this passage here in chapter 16, I'm leading up to it. And then in chapter 15, he talked about abiding. He compared himself to a true vine and his father, the vine dresser, right? He was talking to an agricultural community. Along with his disciples, he says, my father's the vine dresser, I'm the true vine, and you're the branches. He who does not bear fruit is cast off and he's withered away and he's thrown into the fire. And so that was about abiding in him, right? We want to abide in him. Just as he said in, in chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit will abide in in you. And then in chapter 15, verse 26, once again, he revisited the idea of the helper who will testify of him, the Holy Spirit, right? It, it was kind of a continual lesson that he would bring about, almost like birth pangs, closer together. He knew his hour had come. He said he was going to go away. He talked about abiding, he talked about the helper, the Holy Spirit, that would testify of him. But now in chapter 16, he wants to warn his disciples that trouble is in their future. It's on the horizon, right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything's become brand new. But he also said that we're going to endure affliction as a Christian. We don't go the way of the world, right? We don't go the way of the world. Pastor Chuck Smith, he often said, and quoting his mom, he would say, Chuck, anybody can go downstream with the rest of the world, but only a true Christian can go against that flow of the world, right? Only a true Christian. And when he was a kid, he never understood that. But when he got older, he would look at the word of God and say, man, my mom was so sweet. You know, she, she gave me that illustration of what being a Christian is because we go against the grain. We go against the tide of the world. Transgender restrooms, right? The gay agenda, right? And not only that, we, we have immoral conduct that's being condoned. As Isaiah said, good will be called bad, and bad will be noted as being good. And so in chapter 16, he would say in verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. And we, we see that today. We see groups like ISIS, right? We see other groups like I had just mentioned, um, 
communities that say, well, you know, we have civil rights to, to go ahead and, and use a transgender restroom, or we have what we call rights to go ahead and like Bruce Jenner, you know, don't call me Bruce anymore, call me Caitlin. And if my little boy or little girl feels the same when they go to school, well then they should be allowed to or else I'm gonna sue you, right? And so it's the same. We see here that people will think that they're doing God a service, right? Coming against biblical morals and ethics. And so in verse 3, he says, And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father, nor have they known me. But these things I have told you, verse 4, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And the things that I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So when he said there in verse 4 that when the time comes, you may remember Right? The Holy Spirit, as John 14 says in verse 26, the Spirit will remind you. He's going to call to remembrance. He's the helper. He's the still, small voice who's going to remind you. And he already has. He's already directed you. He's reminded you about so many things. About so many things. And he's going to continue to do that. Jesus said that. It's in red letters. And he's talking about going away right here in verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Right? None of you are asking me, hey, where are you going, Jesus? You know, remember back in chapter 14, he said that he's going to go prepare a place for them. That in his father's house, there's many mansions. And if it was not so, he wouldn't say that. And so now he's going to show us right here in verse 6. But because he has said these things, that sorrow has now filled their heart, right? As Christians, we can experience sorrow, right? And we can almost become paralyzed, maybe with, with affliction or, or things going, dysfunction in the home or in my marriage or with my children or with my family. It's kind of like, man, you know, how do I approach this situation, Lord? I know what your verse says, but no, he wants you to lean on that verse. He wants you to lean on what the Holy Spirit is showing you. And he's reminding us here, even with his own disciples, that sorrow has filled their heart, right? But he has to go away, right here in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I'm going to go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. See, he's got to go so the helper can come. He's got to leave so the helper can arrive. He says, I will send him to you, right? He has to go away. So he can be relieved of the limitations, the locality of his physical body. You know, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says that the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. He came from all eternity with the Father, bound in love, to take on the form of a human being. To sit in the womb of his mother, right, for nine months. Imagine humbling yourself, being God, who created the earth and the heavens and all of the galaxies, to humble himself in such a way to sit in the womb of a woman, right in the fetus, in the fetal position like this, to hang out for nine months being God. Imagine that. And so now he's telling them that he's got to go away so the Holy Spirit can come because he can only be in one place at one time, right? He had the ability because he is God, but he humbled himself to the point of a servant, the Bible says. He endured, you know, the physical body, Life. He, he, he wanted to, you know, the Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted and tested, just as we are, but he remained sinless. He was tempted and tested, just as Pastor Jason shared with us, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And he passed all of those tests, right? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God, he said, right? And so Jesus relied on his word. He relied on his word. And he says right here in verse 7 that if he doesn't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come, right? They couldn't see past their sorrow, verse 6, right? Sorrow has filled your heart. We can't see past our, our, our emotions, right? Right? We can't see past our emotions. And part of this study up here on the Holy Spirit and his ministry in your walk 
is to empower you so you don't have to make decisions based on those emotions. Sorrow has filled their heart. He wants them to understand because these guys are going to be used as apostles to launch the church in the book of Acts, right? He wants them to, to, to have a new drive of hope, right? He knows that they're going to witness him being crucified and nailed and scourged and afflicted and the crown of thorns on his head. And he doesn't want them because that's a sight, right? That would freak anybody out, right? We, we sometimes see on YouTube or, or another source where, you know, how Christians are being beheaded. You know, that's a sight, man, right? We're like, man, you know, I know that's happening and I need to know, but that's hard to see, right? And so he knew they were going to endure that. And he's kind of just putting them through a little test right here. Sorrows filled your heart, but I want you to see past that. I want you to see me. Look at me, he's saying. Keep your eyes fixed on me, not on the situation. And so we see here in verse 8, and this is the premier verse that I was given. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Those three things right there. He's going to convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment. You know, that word convict, the NIV, I think it says to prove. He's going to prove his righteousness, right? He's going to prove up to us, to all of mankind, that we do have a sinful nature. We're born into that. And that he is the righteous judge. But in verse 9, he says of sin, because they don't believe in me. They don't believe in me, right? The one thing that we need to come to terms with in this life is to believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our only way to heaven, our only tunnel to, to righteousness, right? And, and so we see here in, in verse 10 of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you'll see me no more. Man, his Father, the righteous one, right? The righteous one. He, he says there's none good, only my Father in heaven, right? He said that in the Gospels. And then in verse 11, of judgment, because of the ruler of this world who is judged, Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4. It says the God of this age, right? He's blinded the minds, not the eyes. He's blinded the minds, the thought process, the reasoning process, right? He's blinded the minds of the non-believer, lest the light of the gospel shall shine upon them. That hope, that great hope in the light of the gospel, Right? The greatest hope. Not Muhammad Ali. You know, rest in peace, man. You know, he had the quickest jab and, and the, one of the greatest left hooks. But he, like, like John the Baptist, right? He, he's not worthy to hold the sandal strap of Jesus, man. The greatest hope is in the gospel. And so we see here that John is sharing that with us. John the beloved who wrote this gospel. So we see there in 16.8 and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The ancient Greek text gives us a, a broader range or a, a broader meaning than our word to convict. It's to declare someone guilty of an offense, right? A criminal offense, mind you. Not just an offense, but a criminal offense, a lawlessness. You know, we think about the criminal element that we've known to mankind. And you could go down a long line of them, right? Including ourselves. We think about Al Capone or John Gotti or, or people about, like uh, Lucky Luciano, you know, famous gangsters. But what about you? What about you guys? What about me? We have that criminal element. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was brought forth in iniquity, right? In the hospital, someone held me or held you, and they said, Oh, how cute. You know, he's got your eyes and your lips and, oh, he made that sound and, oh, he's crying. Get him some milk. And, you know, they're adoring you, right? They're looking at you with adoration. If someone was to say, hey, this guy was brought forth to iniquity, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> Get away from my baby, right? And so we're brought forth in iniquity. Jeremiah 17, 9 says our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who should know it? The Lord knows it. We devise schemes and plans. And wickedness, we do that, man. That's who we are. The, you're going to call the Bible a liar? I'm not going to call the Bible a liar. That's who we are. We need Jesus. We so desperately need him. I'm not going to just say, oh, bro, you need to be saved. No, we desperately need the Holy Spirit, the person 
He's a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember the first time that word convict there in verse 8? Do you remember the first time you were convicted? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about in the courtroom, you know, bang, you know, I, you know, no offense. I'm talking about here. You were convicted, right? It's a declaration of an offense. The Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit who we're talking about right there in verse 8, when he has come, he's going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, right? He does not merely accuse us of our sins. He just doesn't say, you know, oh, well, you're a sinner. He brings them to an inescapable sense of wrong, right? We have this conviction. We're like, man, I, I can't get away. I'm not having fun doing this anymore, right? Remember that? You weren't having fun anymore doing it, and I hope you don't. I hope the conviction continues. I hope you stay in the word of God. I hope the Holy Spirit is allowed in your life. You have no gray areas that not 85%, but 110% is given over to him because we can be 95 percenters all of our walk. And we can have that 5%. It's like, Lord, I know you're going to wink your eye at this part of my life because, you know, it's Saturday night and, you know, my wife, she went out of town and, man, you know, I was just on the internet and I was searching for something legit and it just popped up, Lord, and, you know, now it's just something in my, no, 110%. That's what he wants from you. He wants 110% because the Holy Spirit, he brings the conviction of shame and of guilt before God alone, not before anybody else, before God alone. Romans 3, verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Holy Spirit is not just here for believers or just for non-believers. He's here for all. Right? For the non-believer, his spirit's coming would, would result in a heightened conviction right, to the person's heart to persuade them and to draw them towards salvation. You remember that? Couldn't resist it. For me, it was at Calvary Chapel of Golden Springs. I walked in. I knew nothing about church. I knew nothing about the Bible. And I just sat way in the back. And, and, and Pastor Rawl taught on Proverbs 31 and, and I said, wow, that sounds like a woman I would like to have, you know, single guy, single dad raising my son, full custody of my boy, you know, and I just kind of, we'd go to Disneyland, I'd kind of just look at families and I'd say, wow, I would like that, you know, and when I heard that, I thought, man, that was the hook that the Holy Spirit used, then Raw brought the gospel, bang, and it just hit me, and I no longer thought about the, the, the Proverbs 31 virtuous woman or, or the what ifs in those areas, but I thought about that inescapable sense of wrong to realize that I am guilty of a sinner complex that I've been born with. And so we see here that that's what the Holy Spirit has come to do. That's what he's come to do. He's also a helper in a sense, almost an advocate. Jesus is the advocate, 1 John 2, 1, because of an accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12:10. But the Holy Spirit is the helper. He's involved in pointing out sin in order to bring about repentance, that attitude of repentance, right? That's what, that's what we need to look for when we do an inventory of ourselves. We know we've been messing around. We know we've been meddling. We know there's a gray area. When I know, you know, I'm falling short with my wife or with my kids or with the ministry, you know, I know I need to come before God with an attitude of repentance, and humility before him. I need to say, Lord, I need you for these areas. I can't do it. I need to give it to you because I don't want that, that 5% I've been hanging on to. I, you need to keep it. You already died for it. You've already, you've already declared the victory for it. Why should I hang on to that? Right? It, it makes no sense. And so that spirit of conviction, who's for the believer and for the non-believer, for this godless world, he acts almost even as a counselor for the prosecution, right? For the non-believer. He's the one that brings the conviction. And so his spirit can defend, his spirit can remind, his spirit can convict. But right here in verse 8, he's the spirit of conviction, and he is a person. He is a person. 
He's not an entity. He's not a circus sideshow. He's not, you know, something that we need to say, man, I need more of you. You know, come on, you know, give me a fresh feeling. No, he's a person. He wants that personal relationship with you, that accountability, instructional manual relationship that he has for you right here as well. As he speaks to you every morning, you, there's a passage and a verse that he has for you. Wherever you're at in the Bible, you know, he, he has that special for you. No one else in the world, wherever you're at in the scriptures, because he loves you, he wants to speak to you. And whatever it is you're reading, he wants you to meditate upon that, right? He wants you to meditate upon that. David said in Psalm 119, Lord, how I love thy word. It is my meditation all the day long. Psalm 119, 97. All the day long, Lord. I, I want to meditate as I'm at the red light, as I'm going through a trial, as someone cut me off. And, you know, I want to, you know, it's like, Lord, let me meditate on that word. You know, let me think on that. Let me keep my eyes fixed on you. My mind stayed on you so you can keep me in a perfect peace, right? And so let's look at his threefold ministry as he's looking to convict the world of sin. And I think about the New Testament. I think about, you know, the following passages here, but I prayed and I prayed and I asked the Lord, <clears throat> your Holy Spirit, God. And something stood out to me in Psalm 51. Something stood out to me in Psalm 51, and, and don't turn there, but I'm just going to share one passage. As David said in verse 11, don't cast me away from your presence, and don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. And I thought, Lord, who wrote that? David wrote that. When did David write that? When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite's wife. And I thought, okay, Lord, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you guys would turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 11, and it's in verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 11 picks up when David's armies are out to battle. And we know David, this is the man who's after, he's known as the man uh, that had God's heart. I mean, this was a man who was sold out, even as a little shepherd boy. He had the testimony of defeating lions and bears who came to attack the flock, right? He was an expert at the slingshot in his day. And he had that testimony. He had the testimony of being chosen amongst many brothers, some of them statuesque and big and buff, right? As Samuel the prophet went to choose him over at Jesse's house. And even as he put on the armament, he was a small and a ruddy kid, but he was good looking. The Bible says, but the armament fell off, you know? But as he came against Goliath, if you recall, he said, you know, you come to me with a sword, a javelin, and a spear, but I come in the name of the Jehovah, my great and mighty God, man. And that was his testimony. And even as Saul would try to run him through with a spear, and, and David would, would declare, man, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. You know, far be it from me to do that. And so he had this mighty testimony, and he was known as a great king and still is. Right here in chapter 11, he, he's further down the road in his kingship, somewhat comfortable, it seems. And in verse 11, chapter 11, I mean, verse 1, it says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So, why the spring of the year? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of break this down a little bit for you. Why the spring of the year? Well, because the winters were rough. It was hard for them to get out in, in battle, but let alone in that kind of weather, right? People can get, you know, destroyed in their feet because of the weather, the snow. You know, it was hard to, to carry their armament. It was hard to, to sling their swords in that kind of a, a weather there. But it also says here, and that's the reason, but that David remained in Jerusalem. So he stayed back. He chose to, to stay back, you know, and, and maybe get into the word and pray and seek the Lord on the next battle, perhaps. But it says here in verse 2 that it happened one evening. One evening. 
So we see it right there. This is that transitional part of the book here in verse 2. It happened one evening. This one evening changed the course of David's future forever right here. I don't know. Did you guys ever have this kind of event in your life? It happened one evening or one afternoon or one morning, right? And, you know, you were at a crossroads. You were at a crossroads. Here's a man who's sold out to God. You're sold out to God. And this man is no different than us. And he's at the crossroads where he has to make a choice, an important choice, because Satan's right there just kicking back with him, right? R and R with him. And, and you know, uh, Charles Spurgeon says that idleness is the devil's playground. So be careful. I need to be careful. You know, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked out on the roof of the king or the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. That's what happened that evening. Her beauty, right? That's what caught his attention there. And as we see, it's hot outside, and some of you guys are in shorts. I should have worn my shorts. Here's the summer, guys. And as we're driving down the street, the ladies are wearing shorts and skirts. It happened one afternoon, right? My mind can, can go places, man, right? I can start devising and picturing and kind of enacting in my heart, right, and in my mind, myself, even with that woman. Let's be real. Because the scriptures are being real about King David, right? And so it says here that it happened one evening that he rose from his bed and he walked. In the, in the Hebrew, he paced. He was pacing back and forth, right? When, when we wake up at night and, and we're like, man, I need to pace or I need to open the, open the word of God. Open the word. You have a, a favorite passage. You have a favorite verse. There's something about this wonderful book, man, that, that just... You know, go there, go here, go here. You know, David would even write in Psalm 119, verse 37, Lord, let not my eyes look at worthless things. Revive me in all of your ways, right? Resuscitate me because something about me is dying right now. My eyes are like, they keep going back to that thing, Lord. And so we see here that he's pacing back and forth on the roof. And there's this woman She's only described as a woman there in verse 2, twice, and that she's beautiful. This beautiful woman, she's not noted yet as Bathsheba, right? There's a question that we have to ask. Was this a new thing for David? I mean, he's gazing at women now, or, or is this a new thing? Or was this gazing at women from the rooftops? Is this something that he always did? You know, we have to ask ourselves that, because the Holy Spirit in Psalm 51 that he's pleading with, to not leave him certainly must have been here right now speaking to him. You know, that still small voice that Elijah heard in the cave that wasn't in the lightning or in the wind or the fire. But he was right there within him. And so we see here that this beautiful woman is down there bathing. And by the way, guys, some of you that are single. The women that put themselves in certain places or predicaments in order for a man to gaze at them, you got to think twice about that. Why is she, why is this woman, um, does she not know David's up there? She didn't know? Oh, I didn't know David lived there. Oh, you know, it's news to me. I've lived here all, all of my life. Would you rather hit my husband? You know, <laughs> like, he lives there? Oh, my goodness, right? No. She, mu she may have very well known. I know David's up there. She's the king, man, you know? That's David. That's King David. That's not just the gardener or, or, you know, the superintendent of the grounds here. No, that's David, the king. She knew that was King David. So we got to think twice, you know, kind of uh, investigate spiritually. We're, we're you know, if, if your attention is towards a certain individual that you're attracted to, study them from afar, you know, and, and pray for them as a sister in the Lord. Look at them as a sister in the Lord. See how you can benefit her for the Lord. That's the first question. Let that be your first question. How can I benefit her for Jesus? You know, how can I influence her for God? Lord, let me pray for her. Lord, I pray that she loves you more than any man that she's ever going to love. You know, I pray, God, that, you know, whoever she is, 
that you would just bless her today for your sake. Give her a desire for your word, right? That's the best way you can approach that situation. In verse 3, so David sent and he inquired about the woman. There's his next move. Here's King David, right, who's on a little R&R, and he sends, because he's the king, man. He's got many servants. And someone said to him, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Eliam was one of David's men. That was one of David's mighty men. So this is Eliam's daughter. And Uriah the Hittite, who's not even an Israelite, he's a Hittite. But this is a guy that's out there devoted to Israel, right? And he's out there fighting. But that's the furthest thing from his lustful mind. He's already ran through the night, the roll in the hay with her. He's already ran that through his mind. And so we see here that after he sent those messengers, he took her and she came to him and he lay with her, right? He ignored the warnings. What were the warnings? First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, no temptation is overtaking you except that which is common to man, right? But with that temptation, God will give you a way of escape, a window of escape that you may be able to bear it. What was the window of escape? Well, he could have been in the word. He could have not looked twice, right? He could have took heed to the fact that someone came to him and said, that's the daughter of Iliam. That's the wife of Uriah, David. He had all these things that the Holy Spirit was trying to speak to him about. But we can easily say to the Spirit sometimes, right? Talk to the hand, right? Because I'm over here in my lust. I'm over here, you know, dealing with these things. And so he laid with her, and it says she was cleansed from her, from her impurity in verse 4. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. There it is. The woman conceived. She wasn't already pregnant. Also, it says there that she was cleansed from her impurity. So the word of God wants you to know that this is David's kid, right? Sometimes we can say, well, what if that's Uriah? That was Uriah's kid. Before he, No, this is David's kid. And he didn't take that window of escape. Right? As mighty a warrior he was, a man after God's own heart. Man, I, I mean, David's one of my heroes. He is. I'm not reading this to bash David. Man, I, I can't wait to meet David. But it says that she sent and she told David in verse 5 and said, I'm with child. Right? This is his opportunity to repent right here. This is the next step that the Holy Spirit is taking with him. He could repent. He confess up. That's the hardest thing to do, guys. Right? The hardest thing to do is to open that, that cabinet, that, that secret cabinet that we have, and just start pulling all the stuff out and say, look, here it is. I want to be freed from all this. You know? I, 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 want, I want this to be away from me because I'm tired of going to bed with it. I'm tired of my conscience kind of rolling it around in my mind and in my heart. But it says here, as he goes the opposite direction, that David sent to Joab in verse 6, sending to Joab, he said, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent for Uriah to David. And when Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing. You know, business as usual, David kind of playing that everything's normal with him. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your, your, wash your feet, there in verse 8. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. All this meat and provision, you know, David was hooking him up. And so David's creating an occasion to cover his sin. See that? He, he's not taking heed to that still small voice. He's not listening to the Holy Spirit here. And so it says here that in verse 9 that Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with the servants of his Lord. And he didn't go to his own house. Now, certainly the Spirit must have been working on David's heart. Obviously David's not listening but the Spirit's working on Uriah's heart. Because we see here that when they told David in verse 10, saying that Uriah didn't go down to his house, that David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go to your own house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live, he tells David, and as your soul 
lives, David, I won't do this thing. So even as a Hittite, Uriah had a love for the God of Israel. He had a devotion and a dedication for God. And he's not about to allow anything to divide that from his heart. And it says that David said to Uriah in verse 12, wait here also and tomorrow I won't let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, right? Now when David called him, he ate and he drank before him and he made him drunk. And at evening, he went out to lie in his, on his bed with his servants of his Lord, but he didn't go down to, the, to his house again. He, he still didn't go down to his wife's house. Notice that David got him drunk. Look at the extents that we can go to as we're turning away from the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God, right? To cover our sin. To pull out the alcohol. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And so... It looks like, you know, by persuasion, it looks like by, by pressure that David kind of, you know, got him to drink and to be drunk. But still, Uriah wouldn't go to his house. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. David right here trusted Uriah's integrity to make him the messenger of his own death. Because the letter that David wrote was declaring Uriah's death. He says, if none of those things work, then far be it from me that I'm going to be embarrassed as the king and let my sin be exposed. Notice the, the extent that we can go. You know, we can go to great measures to cover our sin. It says that he wrote the letter saying in verse 15, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and that he may die. Wow. I mean, I look at this and I think, David, he, you know, craftiness, he's arranging this. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew where there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the people of the servants and David, of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. So what is the principle here of, of this story? Galatians 5.16 says to walk in the spirit and don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit, the, whole, the person of the Holy Spirit. If David had his attention on God and listened to the Holy Spirit of God, chances are he would have never fallen in this area. But was it all of a sudden that this came about in his life with Bathsheba? Or can we look a little further back when we stop, men, and we take an inventory of our lives, and we kind of look back at the beginning stages of our walk with the Lord, and how I've kind of constructed, I, I pray biblically, the different areas of my life. David, the Bible teaches in 2 Samuel, I think it's in chapter 5, that he multiplied wives. Deuteronomy, according to the law, Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 says that, you know, they were not to multiply wives, right? Nor horses. David, from the get-go, multiplied wives, right? He says, I'm the king, I, man, I'll get a little harem here, right? And we see what we do affects our family members. Solomon, right? A thousand women in his life. Amazingly crazy. I mean, I, I can't even fathom that. Why? And so David's lust, the lust of the flesh, cannot be satisfied. It wasn't so much, I think, that David wanted Bathsheba. I think it was that he wasn't, happy with what God gave him. He wasn't satisfied with what God had allowed in his life already. And so we see here, if we go down a little bit, in verse 25, David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab, don't let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. So David is addressing his own guilty conscience here. That, you know, what he says there in verse 25, don't let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. That's an old proverb that they would use in wartime, you know, because loved ones, good friends, would get killed. And that's kind of the context that he, he, he wanted it to be looked at. And he said, you know, don't feel bad. This happens. This is war. We're warriors. 
Then the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But one thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. That's the final verse there in in chapter 11. What David had done, it displeased the Lord. You know, this is the first mention of God in that whole chapter. David wasn't about to listen. We saw different attempts there that the Holy Spirit, that God was trying to speak to him through, through servants. You know, that, that's Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba. You know, David, I'm pregnant with your child. You know, he should repent. No. He wasn't about to listen. So God sent Nathan, the prophet, Maybe he'll listen to him, right? And, and we need to look at this too because the Holy Spirit was attempting to speak to him. And God in his word in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, he says, my spirit will not dwell with man forever. He will not dwell with man forever. Don't take it for granted. Romans chapter 6 says, shall we continue to sin that God's grace may abound? And he answers his own rhetorical question. He says, certainly not. Man, what's wrong with you? You know, don't revert back. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the world. It'll gladly take you. You're welcome to go. It'll gladly devour you again. There's no such thing as subtle sin. It'll continue to grow. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so we see here that God sends through Nathan a message. The Lord sent Nathan in verse 1 of chapter 12. And he came to David. And he said to him, there are two men in one city. He's bringing about a story to show David. One rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with his family and his children, and he ate of the food and drank with the family. You can just kind of see the little animal prancing around, and the kids are loving him, and the the family's poor. And he's got this rich neighbor with a, with a mansion. And, and he's, he's illust- making this illustration so David can see himself. We're going to see that. And this traveler in verse 4 came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb. You know, the poor man's lamb, the, the ewe lamb that became a pet to the children. They probably gave him a name and... You know, they, they held him and he went to sleep with them. And, you know, that's just the way it was then. Kind of like you have a dog or a cat. And he took that man's lamb and he prepared that lamb for the man who had come to him. David heard this story, right? His anger was aroused. His anger was aroused. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, he said, as the, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Notice how David right here, he's already bringing a judgment. Here's David standing in his guilt. Murder. Adultery. Notice that. Lying. Most importantly to God, all three. We see here that he says here that this man shall surely die. Verse 6, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, David, You are the man. You're the man. You're that rich man. Uriah the Hittite is the poor man. That Ulam is Bathsheba. You stole his wife, man. You have a a flock of of wives at home, David. What are you doing? You know, what are you doing, David? You, You murdered him. And so Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. So this is the Holy Spirit right here. I anointed you. King over Israel, I delivered you from the hand of Saul. He's allowing David to reflect on the victories that he's had through his great God and Savior. I delivered you, David. I gave you your master's house, in verse 8, and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. 
You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. You know, men, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says that God will not be mocked. Don't be deceived. What a man sows, that he shall reap. Because he says to him, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. From your own house, right? We don't have to cause dysfunction to come to our house. It's already there. It's already there, man. The enemy's working really hard. He's a defeated foe, and he knows his time is at hand, right? He knows his fate. It's already been written. And so we don't need to help him out here. David's helping him out. David is helping Satan to have some real estate on his heart and in his home. Because we know from the turn of events, you know, from all of his children, he had, you know, he had many children, but amongst them was Absalom and, and Amnon and Tamar. And we know that, you know, through a turn of events that Tamar was raped by Amnon. And then Amnon would get murdered by Absalom. And then down the road, even still, Absalom would betray his own dad and take over his kingship, sending David out into the Judean wilderness barefoot, weeping. And so the sword never left his home. He paid dearly. He paid dearly. Verse 12 says, For you did these things secretly. But I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. Wow, that's a tough judgment. That's a hard judgment. But Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12 says that God, whom he loves, he chastens, right? He, he loves you, so he's going to chasten you. He's chastening David hard, real hard. You think about those things. Finally, in verse 13, David says this. To Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. That's all he had to say. And it wasn't empty words. Nathan knew it was from the heart. He knew that he meant it. He has put away your sin and you shall not die. However, verse 14, there's a however. Because by this deed that you did, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord, to blaspheme. Wow. When we sin, when we practice sin, when we get caught up in sin, we give the enemy a great occasion to blaspheme the name of our great God and Savior, whom we're worshiping and holding our hands up to here right now, today, this weekend. And back at home at church, you know, we're holding our hands up to him. And we're like, praise the Lord, man. God is good. And you know, all of that, and that's good. But in our sin, we're giving the enemy an occasion to blaspheme his holy and his mighty name. And, and he's so holy. He's such a holy God. He's so perfect. He's such a beautiful God. And he's so merciful. And he's so gracious to us. And, and he's so mindful of, of your individual situations. He knows each and every situation that you're going through. And he's mindful and he cares so much. And so we give the enemy an occasion to rejoice when we do that, right? Then Nathan departed to his house, verse 15, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it, it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted, and he, went, uh, and he laid down all night on the ground, and the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he wouldn't, and he didn't eat. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. That child died. Such a tragedy. There, there, there's an innocent party here. You know, he didn't ask for this. He didn't ask to be born. You know, he didn't ask to be the child of Bathsheba illegitimately. But he was. And so he paid the price. And David had to watch it happen. Right? Verse 19. Let's go down. Then David saw that his servants were whispering. David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yeah, he's dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. Finally, because he repented, he worshiped. He, he went to his own house, and he requested that they set food before him, and then he ate. 
And his servants said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted, you wept for the child while he was alive, but now that he's dead, you arose and you ate. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? But I shall go to him. But he shall not return to me. So David knew that he'll see him in heaven. David will see this innocent child in heaven. So we see here in verse 13, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. David's confession here shows that he placed the blame squarely on his own shoulders. Right? Through, through the person of the Holy Spirit who was influencing him through Nathan. Right? Through even Bathsheba. Through the servants that he sent to find out who is that woman? You know, who was trying to speak to him. Finally now, you know, now that he's broken, now he can speak to him. Right? Remember when you were broken? How now he can speak to you now. Right? He couldn't speak to me before. Till I was broken. When I mentioned I went to Golden Springs and I, I heard the gospel, I was broken. That's why I was there. I thought, man, I need something. Right? I was broken. Uh, before that, I would say, no, nah, you know what, uh, Jesus is he's fine for you. You need, you need Jesus. Yeah, you should, man. Good for you, bro. Go. You know, but not until I was broken. And so David was broken right here, and he says, I have sinned against the Lord in verse 13. His confession shows that he placed the blame squarely upon himself. Right? Upon himself. No loopholes. He didn't look for excuses, no denials. He didn't minimize his sin, right? He didn't say, well, it was the woman. She shouldn't have, you know, did that in front of me. No blame shifting, right? Like Adam and Eve, right? Remember? And, and we do that. I do that. Lord, forgive me. The cost of ignoring the person of the Holy Spirit for David here. An unwanted pregnancy with Bathsheba. The murder of a friend in Uriah the Hittite. A dead baby. Innocent dead baby. Later down the road, as I said, his, rod, his daughter raped by his son Amnon, his daughter Tamar. Then his son Amnon murdered by Absalom. And then this little civil war that Absalom started against his own dad. Wow, so sad. That betrayal that he had to experience in his life. But as we consider these things and, and we look at how the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to reach us, during times like this, or times that are not as bad as this, I want to go to Psalm 51. Would you guys turn there with me? This is known as the Psalm of Repentance. As I think about how John chapter 16 that we first looked at in verse 8, how the Holy Spirit, you know, he comes to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We see that David came to that place. He came to that place where he would acknowledge that. And nothing says it better than Psalm 51, Psalm 32 as well. But in Psalm 51, he says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, Lord. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Wow. I, I never read that and say, oh, that's cool. No, man. Wow. I mean, David, he, he's repenting. He's, he's laying it out to the Lord. He's not fooling around. He, he's not going to think about minimizing or blame shift anything, man. He's saying, Lord, it was me. It was me. It was King David. I sinned against you, God. I sinned against you. I sinned against Uriah. Lord. I sinned against Bathsheba. I, I sinned against Uriah's family and Bathsheba's family. I, I sinned against the kingdom. I sinned against all of Israel, Lord. I'm the king here. Lord, I sinned against my own body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 20. I'll, I'll read it to you. It says this. It says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 through 20. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. He sins against his own body. Right? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit 
the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what your body is. It's not just your body. It's not just your body. You should take care of it, right? You should eat right and, you know, uh, do what you can. Go to the gym. But it's not just your body. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and who you, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. You've, you've been paid for and bought. Right? And he's not, gonna, he's not looking to have a, a garage sale and sell you off, man. He loves you too much. He loves you too much. He sent his son for you. And if it was only you, he would have sent him just for you. He would have sent him for you alone. I'm convinced of that. He loves you that much. And we see here in, in Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. This is a direct plea for mercy from David. He had sinned, right? He committed murder with his own hands. He committed adultery. His plea was for the covering of his sin, right? The work of the Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit, as we looked at in John. You see the Spirit is bold and, and is constant, right? In, in that situation with Bathsheba through Nathan, man. He, Nathan didn't pull any punches. David, you're the man. You're the man, David. And it was probably hard for Nathan to do that, right? Imagine going up to Pastor Jeff and saying, hey, Jeff, you're the man. You did it, right? It's like, wow. You got to get past Hector first, right? You got to get past his, his security, right? And, you know, that would take some boldness. That's the Holy Spirit. It took bold confrontation of Nathan right there to shake David, right? We need boldness to shake us. We need to be shook, man. If I'm just comfortable in sin and someone just comes and says, hey, bro, it'll be cool, you know, just keep praying. No, you need someone to come and shake you. Right? That's what happened in his situation here. Once David was shaken, he came to honesty. He came to brokenness before God. Not before you. You are not the standard. I'm not the standard. Pastor Jeff is not the standard. God is the standard. The Word of God is the standard. John 16, 8, our verse, right? He's come to convict the world of righteousness. Where does that come from? Not my righteousness. The Word of God. The righteousness is in Jesus. He's the standard, as Jason said earlier. And so that's what David was pleading for. Have mercy upon me, he says, O oh God. Once again, because of the conviction, only the person of the Holy Spirit can bring. This is the prayer of a man who knows he's in sin. This is the prayer of a man who knows he's been separated from his God. Psalm or Isaiah chapter 59 I believe it's verse 1. He says, it's not my arm that's short that can't reach you. It's not my ear that's deaf that can't hear you. It's your sin that has separated you from me. I don't want to be separated from him. I want peace. I want to go to sleep at night and not have to wake up at 2 in the morning and roll around in my head the things that I'm struggling and dealing with. I want him to handle them. I want to sleep like a baby. I want to go to sleep at night, man. I, I'm too busy. I need to sleep. The four or the five hours, man, I need those. I need to give these things to him. David's recorded account that we saw there in 2 Samuel, where he says, I have sinned against the Lord. Men, this world teaches that man is the standard. But he said, I have sinned against the Lord. We can measure fairness. We can measure doing what's right. We can measure what we say to each other, if it's wrong or it's right with the word of God. Men, God is the standard. His word is the standard in which we must measure right and wrong, right? Notice David, he asked for mercy according to the measure of God's loving kindness. God has a measure. His loving kindness is greater than life. Psalm 63 says that right around verse four. Your, your loving kindness is greater than my own personal life. He's so loving and he's so kind. And that may sound soft, you know. That, means, that may sound a little feminine. But we need his loving kindness. We need his loving kindness, right? We like to be treated lovingly and with kindness. We like to return that to, to other people as well. We can't do it appropriately without the Lord. Genuinely without the Lord. Wash me, he says in verse 2 of Psalm 51. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from 
my sin. Notice that throughout verses 1 and 2 and even 3 in Psalm 51, he's claiming his transgressions. He says, blot out my transgressions. Verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse 3, he says, acknowledge my transgression and my sin. He's owning it. He's owning it wholeheartedly. He's not coming with a secondhand kind of a, you know, hey, um, well, Lord, I did do wrong and, and I did trip up, but, you know, I'm depending on your grace and, you know, we'll be good pretty soon. No, Lord, forgive me. Take me back. And so what is confession? The, the Spirit's revealing to us, wash me thoroughly. In the Hebrew, it means multiply my washing. Multiply it. It implies the conviction and the great guilt that the Spirit brings. Lord, I want you to keep washing me. Right? 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And it's going to be through his forgiveness. It's going to be through his mercy. And the word of God in John chapter 15, right around verse 3, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, you're already clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. You're already clean. This, is going to, this word is a cleansing agent. It will cleanse you. It will heal you. It will restore you. Right? And so David confesses right here in verse 51 as we close. David calls sin for what it is. He calls, notice in, in, in Psalm 51, he calls transgression right there in verse 1. This is an offense. This is a crime. This is a sin. In verse 2, he calls it iniquity. Right? This is immoral behavior. Right? He calls it, again, in verse 3, transgressions. And he calls it in verse 4, sin. Right? Sin is missing the mark. It's falling short of God's glory. And it makes me think about a couple of other verses in Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, in chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is Jesus Christ. And then he also says in Hebrews 4.14, See then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. That word confession, what is that? David realized his sin and he, and he confessed without any excuses. Confession, to repent. Well, when I confess my sin, I'm saying the same thing about it that God says about it and he hates it. He hates my sin. He loves me, but he, I, I'm saying, Lord, I'm confessing. I hate that too. Break my heart, that worship song, right? For what breaks yours. Break my heart, Lord. Let me feel about sin the way you feel about sin. And let me react to that the same way you would in love. Right? Don't come Bible thumping and bashing, but lovingly. Right? Lord, give me an approach scripturally, biblically. Lord, help me address these things. And so with that, I pray that the Holy Spirit would, would continue to speak to us as we looked at the life of David. As we reflected on, on chapter 16, verse 8. And how Jesus, he had to leave because he lived in this physical body. That the Holy Spirit could come and convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we saw all three in the life of David there that he was convicted with. And we saw that heart of repentance. Let us go there as David went there. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit can, can bring that conviction. That you can allow your Holy Spirit to direct us. And, and even as we're walking, sometimes, Lord, In sin, sometimes. I've made a decision to, to, to walk that path that I don't, want, I don't even feel like walking it, but I'm, I'm walking it. Lord, may you continue to speak to us. And may we have the conviction that, that you've come to bring through your Holy Spirit. May we have the conviction to, to turn, to repent, and to confess. To say the same about that sin as you say, and that is that you hate it, Lord. Hate it enough to, to not go there again. So, Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord. Bless these men. Encourage them, Lord. Allow them a good night's rest tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.